This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Patrick Gulo. I'm Sam Mercier's. I'm Dave McDonald. And I'm Nate Blyton. This week we'll be featuring the composer Daniel Felsenfeld. He's a New York-based composer. Uh, he has a really cool event coming up soon. It's called Music After. We'll be talking about that in a little bit. Um, and also we'll be going over a piece of it, so stick around for the whole episode. That plus um, we'll be talking about Jennifer Choi, um, the San Francisco Symphony's forays into new media, and program notes, maybe a few other things. It'll be a packed episode. But first, I really want to hear uh, introduce Danny. Uh, Danny, thanks for uh, thanks for coming on the show today. My pleasure. Um, so, music after. Tell us about that. What is what is the deal with this? Well, um, y- you know. I- I, I've been thinking for a long time about, you know, I, I, I was I was a, a couple of blocks away on 9-11 uh, from where it all happened. Uh, and I was staying in the apartment of my friend Eleanor Sandresky. And I had to flee, and I was like, I literally like, walked into a cloud of ash. And, you know, so I had a very personal, immediate experience with this, like so many New Yorkers did. And, wow. you know, I remember a year later, all the tributes and, I, you know, all the... the the, you know, everybody's like screaming, where's the Guernica for this? And all the people reacting. And, I, and I, I, think, I kept thinking, what would be the best reaction we could have to this? And the only thing I could think of was, what if we just found composers or songwriters who were there or who lived there and who were just immediately affected and just do something of theirs? Not even on theme. It didn't have to be about 9-11. It has to be of no particular mood. Just say this person, myself, for example, was there, and this is their music, and um, and and of course this would have to be a really, really long concert, and of course you actually couldn't do it because you couldn't possibly represent everybody that was there, but it would give you this amazing cross section of what, like what we consider a lot of the the world's new music community, how immediately affected they were by this thing. And I, you know, I, I don't want, I don't want serenities. I don't want memorials or lists of names or politics or anything like that. I just, I just wanted the music. And, and, and when, um, when, when there were those, those telethons were happening for Haiti. Um, uh-huh. And I remember everybody was singing mournful song after mournful song to try to raise some money and good on them, seriously. And I remember Wycliffe coming out and, and, and saying basically, enough of this moping let's show them what we do mm-hmm. and that's kind of what i think this concert is is it's like this is what we do you know we're still here everybody who is in every composer of the 53 i think composers or songwriters we're representing uh is is still alive and still composing ostensibly and and you know like this is more of a celebration of the fact that 10 years has gone by and that is still happening and that, to me, was the most important way to do it, and to to make it free, um, and to make it free from foundational support, uh, because you know foundations or big organizations get their snout in it, and that and you know free of advertising, free of politics, <clears throat> just basically it's a gift as a member of the New York music community that myself and my co-producer Eleanor Sandresky, uh, whose apartment I was in that day wanted to give to ourselves and to all anybody who wants to come. That, yeah. that, that's music after in a nutshell. Cool. I, I like on the description <laughs> on the, uh, on, so you, first of all, we should say you're, you're still raising money for, to make this happen. Right. Yeah, we really are. And, um, and since we're grassroots, we're, we're, we're banging the proverbial drum as much as possible. We have three ways if I may plug. Yeah, please give. plug away. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> well, if you go to www.musicafter.com, there's a there's a really neat uh, give tab where you can give through PayPal. You can also go to the site Indiegogo. That's www.indiegogo.com and look for Music After. You can give there. Um, or you can... Uh, if you go to the Music After website and you choose to send a slightly larger donation than you prefer to put on PayPal or Indiegogo, you can write to uh, to Music After directly. There's a way to do that all on the website. So three ways 
to give uh, even five dollars. We've had people give five, six dollars, lots of them. I, I, I don't think that's an insult. I think that's a compliment. If you have two dollars, you know, that's what crowdsourcing is. I want to have lots and lots of people giving us small amounts. It really, really helps. And um, we'll make a, a concert that I think is pretty important happen. And, and, and remember, I'm a volunteer. So I'm making not a dime off of this. Eleanor is a volunteer. Um, many of the musicians involved are waiving their fees. The Joyce has donated the space to us. This is the Joyce Soho. <clears throat> so there's a lot of people who want to be part of this and are willing to not get paid for it. Mm -hmm. um, but we do have some substantial expenses and we're trying to pay every performer uh, if we can. Uh, right. So that's, that's where all that money is going to go. Plus there's, you know, r renting of equipment and you know, right. the usual, the, the personnel, the staff, the theater's free, but the staff are not, <laughs> um, you know, we just, we have expenses like anybody does when they put on, sure. especially an 18 hour show. Yeah. Right. Um, <clears throat> so how's the fundraising going? Um, I'm going to say we're about a third of the way there, Great. which is a nail biter. Um, but we will continue to bite our nails and and uh, and hope for the best. Okay. Yeah. And uh, there, there, I want to point out there is 17 days left on music after uh, <laughs> to for the Indiegogo. Go yeah. For yeah, for for the for the Indiegogo one. But like you said, there are a number of other ways that you can, can get money. So um, yeah. you know, if everybody can contribute to that, it's really fantastic. Um, I was curious, what can you tell us about the programming? Of How does the programming work throughout the entire day? Well, we've divided the day up into five three-hour uh, sections, sets, basically. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to not, we're, you know, we're, first of all, everybody's doing a lot that day. So the scheduling has actually um, been a series of, if you, we also have a page on Facebook. So if this is at all funny to you, you can go look and see the note cards spread out all over the table. Uh -huh. um, we're doing it old school about how to schedule because somebody has to be, we have this quartet that can play from this hour to this hour. And then this person is doing another show at this time. And a lot of people are, a lot of musicians are running around the city that day mm -hmm. playing on multiple uh, benefits and multiple uh, concerts. So uh, that, and plus we don't want to have everything like, we don't want people to feel slighted if they're in the first shift, right? Mm -hmm. If they're in, if they're in the nine mm -hmm. to twelve slot or the eight forty six to uh, to twelve slot, so we have some really great things uh, trying to sort of balance it out throughout the day. The only thing we're gonna have to do is most of the video stuff, anything involving video, um, which we'll have like Dave Cosson doing his one man piano phase, oh, and wow. Kathy Supove, who unfortunately can't be there, will be playing Morton Sabotnik via video. Um, but that'll have to happen <laughs> when it's dark. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm curious about, uh, for instance, it says uh, composers and songwriters. So obviously, there's <laughs> going to be composers in the way we understand what composers are. But um, so, are there other genres or idioms that wouldn't be considered, you know, art music represented? Well, I, I, I'm going to take umbrage with your term art music, but yes, uh. Uh, there there are people like uh, we have. Well, we have like David Lang and David Del Tredici and, and Elliot Carter, uh, you know, people that we we call composers. But then there's people like Laurie Anderson, uh, who will be performing, who, who cool. we are, bridge the gap. And then we have Roseanne Cash uh, being represented by Tiff Merritt. And I think Nicole Atkins is going to play music by uh, hopefully David Byrne and The Strokes. And we have a... Cool. Some music by Lou Reed being sung and David Bowie, Justin uh, Bond of Kiki and Herb fame. Um, and this is, yeah, so we do have a lot of different kinds of, of, of music uh, right. because it's downtown. It's a wild mix of people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To me, the most engaging thing about this concert <clears throat> when I'm reading about it is um, – a lot of pieces that have been written, you know, the pieces are about the sorrow or the people that are gone, um, or they're about, in, in, in more um, disappointing cases, they're about unifying the country around, uh, you know, uh, hatred of somebody else or, you know, disguised as love of America. But to yeah. me, this is about um, two things, moving on um, and bringing people together. And the bringing people together part is the thing thing that I think is uh, makes this really a worthwhile thing in my opinion because I, mean, 
every year on on 9/11, and like I said, I had a particularly close experience. And every year, it's a frustrating day, and every year, it's a lot to think about. And I'm I am by no means alone. In fact, I am spending untold hours assembling a concert of just a small sliver of a small sliver of a small sliver who have a similar story to mine. Um, <clears throat> and every year, I just wish I had somewhere interesting to go where I knew people. I, you know, like, I, I, I don't, I'm not going to go down to the, the, the site with, with the na- list of names and the president. And I, I, I don't want to do that. And I'm not religious, so I don't want to go to church. And, I, I, and every year, I try to do something and every year it just totally fails. And so I thought, well, for the 10 year anniversary, why don't we at least have a place where people can kind of, it's free and you can come and go. And you know, where, where my community, the people that are my family, I feel like, you know, a lot of the music that's been written about 9-11 has been in some kind of weird attempt to offer a, a, some kind of cathedral in which to contemplate 9-11? Yes. And for those of us who are here, we need no excuse. We need not to contemplate it. It, right. it. it is something that's there. We have contemplated it. What we need is just like, you know, some music, I think. It's actually interesting that you said cathedral because what I was thinking when you were <laughs> talking was catharsis, which is sort of similar in this context. People are trying to write a piece that's some sort of cathartic moment where we collectively deal with what happened, but I think more than anything else, time heals, you know, we move on, we keep composing music, and we keep coming together, so congratulations. Well, that's, that, that, that is the idea, and I, and I hate to sound like a California hippie when I say the word healing, um, mm. and it's a word I use only when, you know, like, my leg feels better, but <laughs> <laughs> it is, it is hope, I mean, look, I, those of us, nobody's going to ever be okay after that. It changed everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and we can talk about 9-11, but I, I, I wanted a concert that was not about 9-11, but was about the people that were affected. And it's not portraits and grief. It's not about the dead people. It's not Requiem. And I, again, people ha- have their right to figure this out in the way they need to figure it out. And I have my right to think that's an excellent taste or that is a not excellent taste. And I, I'm, in a weird way, the worst person to judge any kind of 9-11 related art because I can't get past, you know, the, 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 I mean, I know the smell of 9-11 and, and, and it's a, it's difficult once you know that to, to, to hear somebody's serenity and think, okay, I know you were deeply moved and I know you meant this, but come on, you know? So what, so, what we wanted to do was to get the composers and ask them what they wanted. To do. Yeah. Oh, one thing so I really like feel- about, uh, about your description on Indiegogo is that there, there are other places that you can go for all of those other things. Oh, sure. And that, you that you're to, trying you to do this thing is, is, is something that maybe people could do both because you have these nice, nicely segmented sure. things. Um, but this is going to be a different thing from, from the memorializing and the speeches, which I think is really great that you're, that you're offering this thing that um, might for some people serve the same purpose as those things. Um, but is, is is a distinct uh, a distinct kind of event from those. You know, we also we also told every composer we'd love to have you there, but there's going to be no no hard feelings if you can't come, if you don't or if you don't want to come. Like this is yeah. an optional event, and so we, you know, I'm going to say we have approached like you will probably everybody will look at our list and note gaps, um, and. You know, again, I'm going to say from the outset, mea culpa, there are gaps. We could not do this perfectly. But also, there are some names that we approached that just chose not to be involved. And I, and I, they were, everybody's been very gracious and has respected what we were trying to do. <coughs> um, but I, I think that's their right not to be involved. You know, this is a difficult, touchy, hot topic. And if, if it's something you can't even possibly consider being anywhere near, uh, great. And I, sometimes I think I might be stupid because it's a difficult, hot topic for me. And yet this has been, a, I've spent hours and hours and hours talking about 9-11 yeah. um, in, in, by way of planning the concert. And I'll get emails that say like 9-11 floor plan and I'll get a little freaked out just wow. for a second. But it's the floor plan of the theater for the concert. You know, like it, 
it, it's it's a complicated day. Uh, it's a complicated topic, and there are complicated politics in which you can go engage so many other places in New York or get online or do whatever. This yeah. is one concert with one mission, and it's apolitical. Terrific. Hopefully, hopefully. So you you had mentioned that you can tell the smell of 9-11, and um, I wanted to know get your opinion on uh, Steve Reich, Reich's new piece, WTC 9-11, and the associated album cover that was supposed to come out that none such, and, and he both pulled. Um, how did you feel about that, you know, as being a, a 9-11 memorial kind of piece? Well, I'll try to put this briefly, because I know we only have four hours, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> Look, Steve... Uh, it, it comes down to certain things. Um, Steve Reich had an immediate experience of 9/11, so it's not like he's some guy living in in uh, you know in the middle of Taiwan who wanted to write a, a reaction piece to 9/11. He he is certainly entitled to write the piece he wants to write. I have to say, I, 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 like I said, I'm probably the last person who can effectively judge the piece because all it does is like open, is a re-traumatizing. And like when I heard the piece. Which, by the way, I knew was going to be, I knew was called 9-11, but I didn't know it was going to be what it was going to be. Audio of the first responders. Um, I, I, it got my heart racing. It got me really upset. Uh, it got my friends who were sitting around me asking me if I was okay. So clearly it did something. And I don't know if it was the music or if I had just heard the tape. Um, uh, that would have done the same thing. Or if somebody had just said 9-11 first responders, I could have flashed back. So I can't even tell you if it was a good piece or not. I, I love Steve Reich's music for the most part. So I'm going to assume, it, since I love his music, that it was a good piece. But I can't, uh, I can't tell in a way. I'm the last person who can judge that, or I am a group, a member of a group of the last people who can judge it because well, the reaction is too personal. That's an interesting I, thing where this this event is so emotionally charged and such a a thing that has so much content that you have associated with the event that like it kind of whatever Steve Reif put into the piece like his content that he was putting at you is kind of just overwritten instantly as you're hearing it. Like, I mean it's 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 kind of like you know it's it's the opposite of like I don't remember a thing about my wedding day yeah. kind of thing. like right. when something's that deep and that effective it's almost like you know I I can't get over my own personal reaction to it. Mm -hmm. You know, and and nor should I. And so I, 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 but I, but I do want to say that okay. So there's this whole controversy about the cover, and I want to say something that pisses me off, and that Steve Reich, when he decided to change it, um, the the people that were genuinely offended were referred to with that old saw of being the members of the politically correct. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think that's a terrible, terrible thing to call people who are offended by something because it's degrading. Um, and it is also mocking people who probably had a similar reaction to it that I did. That said, I another accusation that got leveled against him was that he was cashing in on some kind of 9-11 industry, which, by the way, just for a side story, I wrote uh, in 2002 a song cycle that was performed once in a church in Brooklyn that had to do with a bridge falling down. Now, yes, it was a piece about 9-11. I was paid no money for it. It has been performed not since. So in 2002, I wrote a five-song cycle, um, and I was accused of cashing in on 9-11 by, by another composer uh, in a very public way, um, whose name I won't say, but I really wish I could. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, I, and I think, you know, cashing in is when you make money. Right. Cashing in is like if... if if, you know, Christina Aguilera had used 9-11 as a way to sell a hit single, I think that that could debatably be cashing in. But he just picked the cover that he thought was appropriate and maybe was offensive to some people. I would rather not ever have to look at that again. Um, so I, I, it's not something I would be like in the store. Remember when they had record stores and you could go buy a record? <laughs> if I picked it up, I wouldn't be like, oh, there's a nice, there's a nice CD. Wonder what's in that. Um, <laughs> nor would I go, well, this will add perfectly to my 9-11 collection. <laughs> but I think it comes down to uh, a, 
a really old question, and this is a big topic, but like, what is the job of an artist? Mm -hmm. um, and I think Steve Reich, I, I think he's a man of serious integrity. I think he's proven that. I think None Such is a label of serious integrity. I think they've proven that. So I'm going to assume that all of these choices were made with as much integrity as they make all their other choices. And it would be really easy for me to be like, you don't know 9-11, man. Let me tell you 9-11. But I can't. You know, he's just, they're just doing what they thought was their job. And, and Steve Reich, when he wrote the piece, was taking this obviously, uh, 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 what, what's the word? Uh, like a reportative uh, uh, approach to it, where he was trying to, to document the, the events of the day in a certain way, and the, the cover served that in a particular way. And I'm glad they had the courage to say, like, look, this is distracting, and it's getting too much attention for the wrong reasons, and everybody's reacting to the piece without having heard it, which is always a great thing to do. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah we, we hate something we haven't heard. That's a great way to think about things. Yeah, so I, I'm, I applaud their courage to, to, to change it. You know, like this is this is a, an era of public opinion in a certain way. People have reactions, right? Um, but you, I'm, well, you you had mentioned that like you'd rather not have to see that image again. I, I don't think you can. I'm, I was, I think Dave, I might have been talking to you about this. Like, I don't. I think it's kind of impossible to not see that image again. Like uh, you're you're fooling yourself in a certain sense to think that you're going to protect yourself from seeing these images and video footage. I mean, if you go on any like the CNN or anything like that, they're constantly showing things like that. And so it, I think it makes the, the cover, I mean, I don't want to say desensitized, but like you're not, it's, it's not like a new thing or something that something no, would blow me no. out of the water. Yeah, but I mean, like, look, it's an unsubtle approach. And sometimes, an mm. un, and I like a lot of unsubtle things. And Steve Reich is not a subtle composer. And that's one of the things I like about him. And I hope he doesn't get mad for me saying that. But I think his one of the things I like about his music is that it is direct and it is straight up and it is it is it is what it is and it's not pretending to be anything at all. So I, I don't think um, I, I I don't think I think he picked a piece a photo that would match um, the unsubtle approach he took. And I just I I don't think they said oh this will pick off the people and cause controversy. Yeah. And, because how many more records? I don't think like, so. Honestly, how many more records is it going to sell if it causes controversy? And like 20, 30? I mean, we live in a small, you know, our world is a small unit selling industry. So I can't imagine them saying like, wow, we'll make an extra $400 for this controversy. Um, so, and the images are there. You're right. Mm -hmm. I'm more offended by like, you know, a couple of years after 9-11. Remember they installed, those of you who live in New York, which is I think just two of us here. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm I'm a recent implant, by the way. Okay, well, a couple of years after uh, after 9/11, they had installed atop the where you enter into the subway. They had installed these uh, television cameras, so they could advertise. Like they have television ads now, just all around New York, and they were mm -hmm. advertising a movie called The Day After Tomorrow very heavily. So wow. I would walk through Manhattan and I would look and and see on television. Uh, people running through the street and collapsing things and towers falling down. And I would be like, oh my God, it's happening again. Oh my God, it's happening again. And I, I, that to me, that's terrible. That's trying to do what everybody I think is accusing Steve Reich of doing, mm. which is selling based on fear. You know, I certainly didn't run to go see the day after tomorrow. Um, but, you know, when the, the images are there, but for some of us, like for me, the images are there when I shut my eyes at night sometimes. It's not like, it's not like these things are, are going to go away. Yeah. I ha it's, it's a nuanced, complicated thing that I have no, like, I, and again, I'm maybe the, re the last person to ask about it because I have such a strong 9-11 reaction that I can't have a, an appropriately distant 9-11 reaction to a, a piece of 9-11 work. Right. Well... I had one other question about music after. Um, sure. Is it is it going to be broadcast in any way? I, we're we're still working on that. It's certainly going to be recorded. I'm not I'm not sure if it's going to be broadcast or not. Okay. Well, ho hope to hear about that. And, and, and before we move away, I don't know if you mentioned this earlier. We we talked about how people can support the project. How can people that are in New York uh, find it and go see it? 
It's uh, well, you can go to the Music After website. It'll give you directions, but it's it's at the Joyce Soho, which is one five five Mercer Street, which is just uh, on Mercer, just below House Street. Okay. So it's right there in Soho. Great. Starting at nine eighteen a.m. and finishing. Oh, that's, after that, that, that's wrong. Starting oh. at eight forty six. Okay. Yeah, that's 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 a that's a that's something we thought we we had the timeline wrong. Weirdly enough. Okay. All right, eight forty six then. And finish eight forty six a.m. Yeah, come first. Uh, mm-hmm. Come at eight forty six. I dare you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, should we move on? Go for it. Um, I noticed on New Music Box this this week. Um, there was a really great profile. Of Jennifer Choi is the recent um newest violinist for Ethel. I noticed um, this great blog post. <laughs> we don't have to talk about that, though. <laughs> uh, but we probably Wait, will. I want, I want to talk about it. <laughs> I wrote a blog post on New Music Box, but some other time. Let's talk about Jennifer Choi, and maybe we'll work that in. <laughs> Anyways, um, Jennifer Choi is kind of doing something that I, I want every musician to do. And she's kind of going out on a limb to try all these different things. And I, I feel like I want every like musician just to really try to grasp this concept that you know they, they don't have to try to get an extra job or something like that. There are plenty of opportunities out there. And I, I, Jennifer Choi gets it. And there's a really great video profile that Molly did um, that interviews her and has some really great, great clips of her playing, especially playing the Zorn piece at the, at the end. You guys should all check it out on your music box. Um, but I don't know. I, is, do you think for, for Jennifer, someone like Jennifer Choi, I don't know her personally. Danny, Danny you said you know her. Um, I know her, but Ethel played, uh, this play is a piece of mine that I used to play last night at the Grand Canyon. Uh, cool. okay. So she, she played it, but I've not yet met her. Okay. Well, what I'm wondering if, if, if this approach to, to, to playing music and to getting involved with new things, is this, do you think this is a pure? What do you mean by the person? approach? Well, the uh, just uh, I guess the idea of of not going down the, the straight and narrow path that has been there forever with getting work for musicians. How oh, she's doing all these other things with new yeah, music she, and improvisation and and right. creatively thinking outside the canon. Do you think this is a personality trait of maybe just her and a, and a few people who are into contemporary classical music, or is this an evolution of the artist in general today? What do you guys think? Well, I think it's something that's not for everybody. You know, there there are a lot of people that, that go to conservatories and learn to play music, and that's all they know, is they know how to play Brahms in a violin section. And they don't learn a lot else. And there are other people that go to conservatory, and they learn that, and then they spend all of their time outside of that learning about all these other things. And I think there are some people that are, that are just hardwired to try to find new things all the time. And those are the people, I think, a lot of times that become composers, but also um, that are find themselves performing new music a lot. You know, you have to have this really intense driving curiosity. And I think not everybody that goes into music has that. Clearly, you know, Jennifer Choi does. You have to hustle. Yeah. You know, if you want to make, you have to make your own opportunities and you have to, you know... Uh, because you, if you're if you're playing new music, but you're kind of playing the standard new music canon in a way, which now exists, mm-hmm. you know, because you could make a whole, you could make your whole thing is like I only play the music of Carter and Boulez and Zanakis and that and that sort of brand of, of of music, and you're you're kind of playing canonic new music. But if you're if you're going all over the map, you got to be willing to, to to chase that, and I don't think a lot of people are. Um, something interesting to me was her statement in the video about how it's, uh, I can't remember, it might have been Sibelius. She says it's harder to play, to, it's, it's more stressful and harder worrying about playing the Sibelius violin concerto perfectly than doing all these other things that she does. Um, so rather than something that's challenging or difficult to her, it seems like it's actually an escape from what she seems to be describing as sort of the prison of being that violin player where you can do all the War horses on two rehearsals, et cetera, et cetera. Um, um, so yeah. Uh, and the other thing is, um, 
she seems so vibrant and like I imagine her as like if she were a teacher somewhere, I'm like she would be a great person for a music program to really spark it and liven it up. But ultimately, she's not doing anything that's that unusual. I mean, she's not that far outside the box, but I still feel that way about her in the music department, which to me says, you know, a little bit could go a long way in most music departments. Yeah. Um, I know. I'd, I'd love to have someone like Jennifer Troy teach me violin if I was yeah, a violinist. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, she's into improvisation, which I think is probably pretty rare for <laughs> Uh, academic violinists but you know it sounds pretty like jazz or commercial music centered uh, in other words there's templates for doing what she does and it could be taught and i yeah. think that would be a great thing in a music school so nate you do a lot of this kind of stuff nate <laughs> is going to be leaving today nate nate went to school and took viola lessons at school mm-hmm. but he's going to be leaving right after the show to go play a gig with a klezmer band where he plays accordion Fantastic. <laughs> so, Thanks. and and he's gonna have to leave because he moved away playing piano in a salsa band. Yeah. So, <laughs> so Nate, what has your experience been like for this kind of thing? Well, I I got into music kind of in two ways. Of uh, <laughs> it was like playing with my family and friends, doing half improv, um, and just playing with each other and having that be more of what you do. And then doing classical music, playing violas since I was in fourth grade. And, um, I don't know. It, what, I, what I hear Jennifer Choi talk about is using different muscles. Because, I mean, she's obviously a brilliant classical player and can, can do those interpretations of those classic canonical pieces. Um, and she says she can pull out that virtuoso violinist person out of herself. And it's not that it's easier to do the other, uh, or that it's like putting less of that detailed classical work into these new pieces or into her improvisation. It's just exercising different muscles and doing new interpretations and, and using a different kind of creativity to make the same quality of music. And I don't know, with, with improv, like I, I have been, in my limited uh, experience of seeing what people are learning in music schools. It does seem like it's it is growing, of more people getting interested, coming from a classical background into a jazz or or fiddle or any or folk or whatever kind of uh, thing. Of like yeah, more more classical players and fishing school and then going playing in rock bands and met some people here moving into Grand Rapids that have taken that track and it's really cool to see. But so it seems weird to me that we're still having this, this conversation. In the first yeah, because yeah. I feel like it's, it, I I don't know I do not know a single musician who's just classical and that's all they do and you know like I, I you know I I really really don't seriously um, you don't <laughs> no nobody I went to I, school I really find that hard to believe. I, well, I mean, well, what, well, I mean, maybe, okay, maybe that's what they play. Maybe that's all they play. But that's not where they're. I mean, I mean, I know a couple of people in orchestras who are sort of like in orchestra, and that's kind of what they do. But mm-hmm. they're always interested in other things, and it's not like it's not like they don't think that's valid, or they don't think the other kind of music is is worth listening to. It just they get a job and they do their job, and that's the kind of a thing. But I know very few people who aren't. I mean, you know, I live in New York, so it's a, it's a, it's you know, the the crowd here is a, is a little bit uh, wilier, I suppose. But I feel like most of the classical people I know want to kind of be in, in, in indie rock or rock and roll or yeah. some version of that. It's very impressive and it's very fun and it's it's a lot to them probably sexier than being compared to every other person playing the Sibelius violin concerto. Right, and that's where the stress comes of having to do this same interpretation better than this person who did it perfectly. <laughs> right, like, who's, who's been dead for 20 years. Yeah, before. and there's already 40 recordings of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think you're probably right. You probably have the experience you have by virtue of living in New York, but I don't know. <laughs> Try visiting a state school in the Midwest, and, and I bet you'll find quite a few people who care nothing about anything other than learning their excerpts and trying to get an orchestra gig, and that's well, think, all they think, think about. It's, it's just they're told, you know, this is, this is the way to get work. Well, sure. Especially somewhere in the Midwest. Or something I'm not like saying that. In New they York, you, aren't this, bad for that or something. They're part of a system that's 
for better or worse, or well, for worse, encourages them <laughs> to behave that way. Exactly. Look, in, New York, in New York, if I said I want to start in a, a new music ensemble that's also going to focus on playing, you know, uh, jazz and you know, Stockhausen style, they'd be like, "Great, pick a number." There's like a lot of people doing doing exactly that nearby. So it's not it, from my perspective, which is admittedly, you know, from this from living in New York, uh, where you live in this province where everybody also lives in the same province. Um, there's so much going on that like to say to say something crosses a boundary is kind of it, it doesn't even feel like it it that even like those boundaries don't feel like they exist like they used to mm -hmm. at least for me well, that's a good thing yeah that, that sounds I, like I, a positive I, think so. I do think so i really yeah. do do think so i mean like that that's why i felt very comfortable when we're not to go back to music after but like when we're programming this not to just be like, let's just stick with the composers who were down there. And, you know, like I like the idea that we're going to have a David Del Tredigy by Elliot Carter, by Philip Glass, by Nicole Atkins singing a song by The Strokes. Like, I think this is a really great, mm -hmm. th this is what this Absolutely. is. Absolutely. And this is, this is, I, I can't see any bad coming from this. Yeah. No, of course not. Um, you know, people. What we can tell from you know, today's today's uh, you know, public personality is that you know, this is really accepted and people want to hear that. It's exactly what you're talking about. Sure. Um, okay, can we... Yeah. Uh, actually, while we're uh, talking about music after, you're not going to have program notes. We're not. Okay. That's and good. And so, he, here's the thing. There was recently a, a, a review by Alan Cozen in the Times talking about the Locrian Chamber Players' recent uh, performance that happened. And a as a rule, the Locrian Chamber Players do not have program notes at their concerts, and they don't feature pieces that are older than 10 years. Except <laughs> when they do. Um, yeah. With that's pretty slight, some exceptions. Well, yeah, so this concert was an exception. They did provide program notes, but only after the concert had ended. Um, and I think there was a piece that might have been 11 years old or something like that. Oh, so, yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. Wow. There was an 11 year old piece and they had program notes after. It's almost so, into the 20th century. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah that's, that's 20, we're talking 20th century there. Really. That's old school. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is the virtue of this kind of practice? Dust off the score. <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't, so, it, in, in, the, in the review that you mentioned, it specifically said that they don't provide program notes because they don't want the audience to have to come into the piece with preconceptions. What if the piece calls for like? All right, we'll talk about that later. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say sometimes, sometimes the audience does. You do want the audience to have preconceptions, and a lot of times, the, there's a lot of information encoded in the title. Right. You know, yes, and exactly. and that can kind of make its own program is. note. In, in your head, there's, I mean, a big difference, obviously, between calling something string quartet number two and calling it black angels, you know? Um, so I, th I think there's kind of a fine line between those two things. I do like that they gave the extra information at some point. Um, I think, I, it, I don't think it's a bad thing to give people that information though. They can do with it whatever they want. You know, if, if the, if if I as an audience member don't want to have any preconceptions coming into the piece, I just won't read the notes. Right. But sometimes I do. But we have to uh, remember that we are a, a very select group of people who do this, who are in this for lifers. You know. So we, right. We, we've been to lots of concerts. We've heard lots of pieces. You know, and I think like if I have to read one more person's bio, um, you know, I, provided you know, before where you can see the incredible, like the validity of the composer that whose music we're about to hear based on whatever approval they've gotten from whatever they do. You know, I used to have a bio that, that said, this is stupid, but I used to have a bio that said, Daniel Felsenfeld has written for all the right people, won all the right awards, and has been to all the right schools where he studied with the right teacher. He lives in the right city. <laughs> Daniel Felsenfeld. Every bio was. Yeah. Right. An explanation of, of nothing else other than than like a a, a of their CV, and that's it's very dull. And program notes 
we all know can 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 bore just bore you to death with like the I wanted to write a piece that I was struck by the notion of blah blah blah. You know, in the old <laughs> academic style, I mean, you know, a zero three four cell that <laughs> we want to call it. Um, but I, I I feel like if you know you're writing a piece for the Locrian chamber players, and you know there's not going to be program notes. That's going to affect you as a composer. I think that's really interesting. Then you got to then you got to not uh, let the program notes help you. You got to be more specific, and uh, you got to let your title do its talking, and you got to let your I'm afraid your music do its talking. That, that sounds hard. <laughs> I think it's, it's hard. music I, is hard. Yeah. I feel like in the last several years, I've encountered more situations where the program notes were silly and I could have completely done without them than the inverse of that, where they were informative and they informed me in some meaningful way. Um, they're either uh, about this piece is so incredibly awesome and it's going to be enjoyed all over the world, just wait and see, or this piece is super complex and awesome. Let me explain how super complex and awesome it is to you um, so that when you hear it, you'll understand its awesomeness. And I don't care for either don't, of them. Don't forget the ever-popular, uh, this piece is based on a, a vision I had about a bear in the woods <laughs> that led me to the mountaintop where it, sh it, it showed me its soul and uh, we were melded together as one being. Yeah. I hope I mean, he doesn't I, listen I, to our I show. Sometimes like to, I like to know things about about the, the composers. I mean, I'm mm -hmm. I'm more of, I've got a psychological approach to everything, so I want to know like you know I, I want I I like to know the history of the piece. Like when was it written? Yeah, you know, who played it first? Those kinds of things they they interest me because this is our business. So in a weird way, it's like reading the Wall Street Journal. You know, it's like oh, oh this piece was written for these people and these people have played it. Like I like to know a little bit about where the piece has traveled. Is this the first time? And I like to know, uh, you know, like I would love to like, if the composer could kind of sit down with me and say, you know what, I really wanted to write a piece that, that started slow and got faster and, or what, or, you know, something that mundane or, you know, I had a vision in the box or whatever they want to say. I, I, I always find that neat. Mm -hmm. Not necessary, but I always find it neat. You know? Yeah. Do like you find that... Do you find that it, it impacts the way you hear the piece as as the Locrian chamber players propose? Well, I, I it probably it probably does, but so so does wherever I'm sitting and whatever I'm wearing and whoever I'm with and you know like yeah. it's, it, it, not to the detriment of anything. I mean like I've been annoyed with program notes more than I've been enlightened by them. Right. I, I think we I think could all agree really with that. Clear. <clears throat> yeah, I love when it says, like, this composer has finally figured out a way to eliminate cadences or something like that. <laughs> yes. Well, like, as if, wow, we're all past that now. Where are it's the cameras? I, I, I <laughs> wanted to investigate the minor second or some. Yeah. Oh, I, I love this piece explores thirds. Like, uh, no music has ever done that before. <laughs> just using some sort of, like, theoretical frequency selection type of uh, explanation for why it's awesome, that's a bankrupt route to take because any kind of thing like that's been done. Yeah. Well, it's an in-crowd in route to take. It's yeah. definitely something where you're, you're speaking only to people who will be able to speak that language. It, it's, it, it would be like just if the program notes were written in, in Etruscan, okay? Mm. So like only the Etruscan speakers in the room would be able to understand them. And that's fine if you really only want to write for the people who do happen to speak Etruscan. Um, but otherwise, you know, you're, you're not, if you have to either write for the general audience that, like for your ideal listener, which is somebody who maybe you don't know, weirdly, um, yeah. or who isn't a composer, a, another weird, um, who can come in, come in, listen to the music, but also want to be informed a little bit about how it was made and the person that made it. Yeah, we're not doing program notes of music after just because I don't know that we can. That would yeah. be a serious book. <laughs> that would be like a book, and we're, you know, like we're already which which on. I'm going to be way too many people there too. I would yeah. add is is it's a good, great and, idea for a book. <laughs> what, it's a good idea for a book. Put yeah, together I'm all the program book. notes for the pieces that you're having and sell it as a book. Oh, you no, know, that's actually not a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> you could have, uh, could have pro individual program notes supplied by the uh, 
the composers that are available online if people want to peruse them. We are we are going to uh, not because we're not going to also have a program. So what we'll be missing, uh, unfortunately, is the names of the piece and the name of the people playing. So we're going to have everything read aloud, mm-hmm. uh, cool. yeah. either by myself or by some other members of the musical community uh, before and or after, just so it'll be announced. It'll be like a radio show in a certain way. That sounds yeah, cool. composer really wants us to say a sentence or two. We're happy to do that. Or right. You know, so we will have, you know, we will let the composer decide. Great. I do kind of like having the physical thing to take away with me so that when I, when I, you know, I'm trying to tell somebody else about this great piece that I heard. I yeah. don't have to re- remember everything about it. I can say, oh, it's it's right here on this thing. Yeah. Right. So then that's something you can sell to them later. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Capitalism. Mm-hmm. Step three, profit. <laughs> yeah, but if you're talking about making program notes for new music, what kind of profit are you really going to make? It's a fair point. Touche. <laughs> this is all, all of our problem. Our, our <laughs> yeah. So should we move on to our next? Well, how much time we got? Let's uh, oh, <laughs> let's let's do Louisville quick, and then we'll go to the pick. Sounds good. Louisville, Louisville was out. Oh, I thought Louisville was out. Okay. It wasn't on the list. Also, real quick, it is on the one, list. Dave, well, they're in trouble. That's... You realize there's a composer in New York who you need to go take out, right? Yeah, I know. Totally on, got your name in this. So, in this article that we just <laughs> talked about, this Alan Cozin review, there is a composer whose name is exactly the same first name and last name as me. So that's going to be a problem. You and purpose. me, McDonald. You and me. <laughs> right. Can be only one. <laughs> this name isn't big enough for the two of us. Okay. So really quickly, the the Louisville Orchestra is is in a bad way. Uh, the American Federation of Musicians has placed the orchestra on its unfair list, and this has happened before recently. We of course spoke a lot about the Detroit Symphony Orchestra back in January and February. In in January, sometime the AFM put the Detroit Symphony on its unfair list, and while a an orchestra or any organization is on the AFM's unfair list. Um, it is against the rules for any union musician to perform for them, um, which really was not in danger of happening at all. It's kind of more political move than anything else. Um, so that there's, there's that going on. And the Louisville orchestra itself has gradually been, hinting more and more strongly that they might be interested in hiring um, non-union, non-union musicians, which would just be a real, really terrible move. Um, the AFM has been kind of circulating some information around to the local music schools in the area because, you know, the college kids just may not know any better that you shouldn't work for this because it would have a pretty negative impact on the rest of your career. Um, and uh, I now guess they're joining all the cool new music crowds in New York City. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I don't know. What, how do you guys? You guys have you read anything about this situation in Louisville? Well, I mean, according to Drew, it's basically uh, according to the article, um, the machinery of this crisis, if you will, is underway, and um, one thing causes another. And these things don't have to happen, but they just are. Right. Um, the musicians are saying that the the being put on no, they're 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 claiming that being put on the unfair list makes it impossible for them to move forward. But it really doesn't have any effect on whether or not they're able to barter a deal with the musicians or not. No. They're just using that as a thing to say, sort of like, well, you did this to us, so now we're going to release this press release that says we're going to have to cancel concerts, et cetera, et cetera. And the chances that the orchestra is actually going to hire non-union musicians, I think, is very slim. Right. I don't, I don't think there's a, a, a large history of that happening. Well, you, there's not a lot of precedent you, for that. You heard the, the kerfuffle that happened uh, in Detroit when, when, who was it? The, I can't remember. One of the somebody on the board or or in the administration had had hinted at that possibly, and then you know, the, well, that's the especially a big exploded. deal in Detroit. They don't, yeah. they don't they don't like scabs in that Union Town. <laughs> um, but uh, it, I mean, it's like like we like I said earlier, a lot of these things back and forth are 
entirely about the politics of the situation. There, there, there's very little real impact, I think, to a lot of these things. Right. The orchestra's not going to hire scabs. They're just doing that to scare the musicians. The musicians are going to take the Louisville Orchestra off the unfair list as soon as they reach a deal. It's, I mean, it's kind of an empty gesture on both sides, but still one that um, takes them farther and farther away from getting any kind of deal worked out just because it makes them angrier at one another. Right. Well, um, Drew, who, if I had to pick someone I know who knows the most about it, I would... (laughs) Drew McManus of Adaptistration. Right, I would respect his opinion, says that because of the financial situation they're actually in, it has the potential to be worse than Detroit. Yeah, yeah, they are well, in a messier financial situation. Or it could be fixed now, but they're they're not in a good way financially. So, anyway, that is the story with the Louisville Orchestra. They are not doing so hot, but they haven't been doing too hot for a while now. So this is not, not exactly news per se, but uh, they've been certainly written about in the news quite a bit. Yeah. Yep. And so moving on to an orchestra that has had unbelievable success, so much so that they were only $800,000 in full last year. <laughs> hey, that ain't amazing. bad. Hey man, don't don't turn your nose up at 800,000 in the hole. That's right. That's MTP that's will have your head. Yeah, so the San Francisco um Symphony uh, MTT. Uh, the article is that we're looking at Michael week, Tilson to... Thomas. If you're not familiar with MTT, mm-hmm. everybody right. knows MTT. The article is supposed to be about how they're uh, embracing social media, and uh, I think until the the site that they were talking about actually launches, um, it's not going to be. It's going to be hard to tell. They I, do I have... ask one. Can I ask one question? Sure. Is there mm-hmm. anybody not embracing social media? Uh, well, I mean, it's a, it's a weird thing to keep reading in the social media about how people are embracing social media. Yeah, maybe you just I don't hear about things it. that aren't embracing it. I think people, uh, you know, data about your life that you create and other people create in relation <laughs> to you gets taken up and processed through the social media networks, through the crunch, through the machine. But that's not the same as embracing it in a way as in trying to make some uh, conscientious and intentional use out of it. Rather than it just being there, I see what you're right. To me, that's the delineation. Okay. So social media needs to take one more step, I think, more so as as far as classical artists, um, artists in general are concerned. In that, a lot of people who have representation, you know, they'll, they'll create the Twitter account and the Facebook account, and things will be posted on these outlets about upcoming concerts and stuff. But some people haven't haven't had that push to really do it themselves and say like. I'm doing this and create their own online personality. That's the thing um, because social yeah. media lets you connect with people. It doesn't, social media it's doesn't not do to let you connect with brands and you it can connect with a brand through a person. And that's, I think the thing that, that a lot of these institutional Twitter and Facebook accounts are missing is, yeah, is this, this individual connection. So you're creating people. an online identity of some sort for an individual or for an organization, but nothing is created or sustained without content. That content, the networks are just conduits. Content is what does the identity right. creation, if you will. Mm-hmm. And that's when I what see, aren't when I see somebody When I see somebody from an institution, organization, or an, or an artist in general, use the word I, I love that. Oh, yeah. It, it, it beats anything. As far as getting to know that artist online or, or what they think about something, and that's the next step that needs to happen, I think. And if and if some and if a big organization like San Francisco Symphony can pull off something similar to that, it's difficult with a big group. But I mean, I would I would be ecstatic. And, and this is sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say this isn't just like social media; it's like new media in general. So they're going to create this whole section of the site that will have videos, interviews, and everything like that. It's a whole archive of a bunch of a bunch of stuff so yeah, yeah i think it's unfortunate that actually the word social media get used because certainly that's what we're talking about more or less but i think lots of people subscribe certain they inject meaning into it when you use those words social media yeah people's lives and the things that they do are networked and that data is networked across different platforms 
and platforms that are described as social media are one of those platforms. Well, that's the thing. It's got to be social. So so often it's not. It's got to be right. a two-way thing. It's not the same as having another cable network that only goes one way. Right. Um, the, the, the thing that's useful about new media and social media is that there's a back and forth, that there's content from the institution, but there are also there's also content from the fans of that institution that are, that's incorporated as well. Right. Well, that, to go back to the, the Steve Rice, uh, none such thing, I, the, 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 the principal objections were on social media. Right. And, mm-hmm. and, and it was, it was actually sort of amazing to, to, to follow, you know, the people who I follow on Twitter and, and, and Facebook and watch their reactions and to know that so was, so was the artist and so was the company. And they were, it wasn't something that they weren't being like, ah, the, the, the young kids on the computer, but they were <laughs> embracing it as a real thing that they needed to take seriously and they needed to, to heed. It doesn't mean you do everything that is, that somebody tells you to do on Twitter, please. Um, <laughs> but, but when, when they're, that's, this is the whole point of a ground swelly kind of way of thinking is that, and that's what social media is. It's not just, one guy on a computer talking to another guy on a computer. It's creating its own kind of, it's you using the platforms to create something, whether it's a presence or an announcement or a network of people that are of like mind or whatever you're using. That's what the, that's what's exciting about social media is, is that it's creating uh, like, like we're like what we are doing now uh, is, is pretty, is a pretty fantastic use of social media because we're actually having a, a smart conversation. <laughs> Thanks, I like you too. That's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of, of very smart things, and you know, I, I, I think it's I think it's important that we we note that that's the social media that that is, you know, that is artists and people and people and other people, and it's not just like oh my god, Beyonce wrote back to me on Twitter, but it is creating like pockets of, of thought and pockets of, of expression and pockets of like-minded people who, who have a little bit of a voice. It's, it's exciting. Yeah. We had an exciting little news, moment on Twitter yesterday. Uses, Sorry, go ahead. I, I don't know if it's news that an organization uses social media or even that they use it well, because it sort of seems like at this point, it seems like, you know, San Francisco Symphony has a website. Like everybody's got a website. It right. should have a website. And there, and I see why that one is is getting particular focus, but hopefully in a few years this will not be something that we're even commenting on. Steve, yeah. Yeah. One thing yeah. though. Well, I mean, we uh, in in I run into it all the time where people want to talk about social media and sort of uh, immediately downgrade the seriousness of whatever piece of data they got from that, and you know that's like automatically downgrading the seriousness of something that was written by pencil. It's just a medium for getting the information there. Sure. Um, so it is new too. It's a, it's an infant way of communicating. You know, we're right, still, so, still figuring it out. Yeah, absolutely. And it needs to be taught in school because it's a literacy issue. And if you talk to me sure. for a while, you'll figure out that's one of my pet projects. Yeah. I, I agree with you. I agree with you. Um, as, as a, as a parting shot on this, uh, this thing about the San Francisco orchestra, one of the things that social media does is makes it so when people say things that are patently ridiculous, they get called on them because they get spread around a lot, such mm-hmm. as. <laughs> this is off topic, but I saw this and I just couldn't believe it. Pop music is wonderful, Mr. Uh, Mr. Tilson Thomas added, but it is often ephemeral because it is based on one particular groove, one particular idea. By contrast, he said, classical music is essential because it describes how we really are. So what the heck does that even mean? <laughs> I I freaked out at that at first too, and then I looked at the next uh, the next paragraph after that is just it. Uh, well, maybe it yeah. It's about yeah. You freaked we, out about it. That's right. Yeah, we we contain multitudes, and so that there's just so many different kinds of content, so different so many different kinds of sound that happen in classical music. With that tagged on to the end of that, I mean. Well, I don't know if that makes it any better. Genres yeah. mean a different things, or mean mean something different in popular music versus classical music or concert music or whatever. And I, I just, thinking about it in that way, I think that that might be fair. But saying it that way is certainly like raises the hairs on the back of my neck a little bit. It's such an obviously contestable point of view that it seems ridiculous that he said that. 
I mean, uh, contestable, well, and also it just doesn't really make much sense. Like, what does classical music is essential because it describes how we really are? Yeah, and the, mean? the clear statement about popular music and then the, the weird one about classical music seems telling as well. To me, that's know. a statement banking on the fact that people are just going to let it slide because classical music is still music with a capital M in it, and the other music is just lowercase m. Yeah, but in this day and age where there's, the distinctions are a little blurrier, mm -hmm. and to say classical music, that's 900 years plus of music. You can't put it into one capitalized thing anymore that you can do pop music. Right. You know, it's, yeah. it's too much. And you want to, like, who, like, raise your hand if you can quickly think of a pop song that doesn't go on a single groove or move. Right. I'm, not, mean, I'm not contesting that, that assertion. I'm so, mainly contesting the 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 last part of that, which to me doesn't make any sense. Right. Yeah. And neither neither part of that makes sense. Right. So that's fair. But anyway, <laughs> on to the pick of the week. Woo! Pick of the week, Patrick. What do we got this week? Well, I was hoping uh, Daniel might introduce the piece. Do we know what your piece is? It, it's uh, no. Which one is it? <laughs> is it e either on, one on 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 murder. <laughs> Oh yeah, okay. This is called. This actually. This piece is actually called "Every Composer Is a Murderer." You've played some of it on this show before. Because you had Mirene <laughs> on here. Yes. Right. Um, right. And it's a piece I'm real proud of because uh, it, it was written uh, in uh, coordination with my friend Wesley Stace's novel Charles Jessel, considered as a murderer. Uh, Wes also goes under the uh, the uh, nom de pop. Uh, 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 John Wesley Harding. Uh, he's a great songwriter and he's also a great novelist. And uh, this novel uh, is about a composer. So I, I and in the book, the composer takes um, the the book on murder, considered as one of the fine arts by De Quincey, and makes a little sweet out of it. And I thought, well, I'm not going to pretend to be this fictional composer, but I'm going to do that project anyway. So Wes devised the lyrics. Uh, from from De Quincey and added some of his own and I wrote the music. Okay. I don't know what song you're. I don't know which song you're playing. Well, do you, you have, have a preference? preference? Um, if you play the last one, it has. I, I believe it'll have Wes read it so you can hear. Um, it, like, because the whole point of this piece was to go. Uh, he didn't want to just do a book tour, and read from his novel. He so the way this would work was he would read. And then they'd play a song, he'd read more, they'd play a song, oh, that's cool. read more. So he turned it into like a little event, which was which I thought was spectacularly successful every time it happened. That cool. sounds so very cool. And the last one, you can hear uh you can hear Wes reading. Yeah, we'll do that. We'll play a little of that. Great. Go ahead, Nate. A common hallmark of a composer's late period is the reconciliation of previously conflicting aesthetics, a full synthesis of early and middle styles, as though the two have reached a détente and the composer is mature enough to admit it. In Jessel's case, and with specific reference to Little Musgrave, he returned to his roots in folk music, but subjected its simplicity to a rigorous melodic reimagination typical of his middle period. It is a tragedy, though not the gravest in Jessold's tale, that the composer's fully developed style was glimpsed only in one opera. Composers regularly undergo a necessary period of neglect after their death. This period has been exceptional for Charles Jessold, for exceptional reasons.
play just that clip. But thank you for sharing that with us, Daniel. That was great. That's really beautiful. Thanks. That the straight tone entrance, the voice. That's that something I was curious about too. I, long straight tone that was really effective. That's uh, that's Melissa Hughes. We give her all the credit for that. Awesome. So it's kind of a little bit less of the typical classical singing that we're used to, for better or for worse. Is that something that you asked for, or is that her decision? The, the rest, the rest of the piece is a little more like the the, the fictional character is a uh, is of the Cowpat school of British compos- uh, composers. Mm-hmm. So the rest of the piece is not in that world, but it's a little bit more like that. Mm-hmm. So this, I just wanted to be weird and kind of ethereal and and when you have uh i just want to plug melissa hughes she can kind of do anything um so at pretty much you ask her to do whatever kind of sound and she can make it um so i thought a straight tone might sound really nice there like almost like a boy soprano yeah yeah that's really great i also did so tell us about the selection of harpsichord um well uh, it's it's a combination that Jessel, the fictional composer, would because it's flute, cello, and harpsichord, but it also gives an ancient sound. Also, you can synthesize a harpsichord. You can use a synthesizer. You mm-hmm. don't need a piano. It's right. the only sound. It's the only sound I ever feel comfortable using a synthesizer for. So practical. Plus, I just like the harpsichord. Yeah. Right. I think it it, it nicely evokes the idea of like the composer with a capital C. Writing right. music with a powdered wig and a quill, you know. Sure. I think it's it, it <laughs> meshes with that idea of a composer and being forgotten for a while and then like being rediscovered. It's, it, it, I think it it kind of evokes that idea from the everyone story. Should read, everyone should, by the way, should read the book. It's quite good, and it's especially you know it, it's it's a neat example of a fictional composer written extremely well. Sure. Yeah, I really will now. We'll have a we'll yeah. have a link to that in a, in the show notes. Absolutely. Yeah. That sounds really interesting. It, it is really interesting. And yeah, the author's name one more time? Uh, it's called uh, Charles Jessold considered as a murderer and it is by Wesley Stace. Okay. Cool. And if you buy the American edition, you can see at least two notes of mine on the cover. Ooh. <laughs> Very exciting. Did you get a did you, did you get a little something on the back end for that? No. <laughs> Back end of what? I, exactly. <laughs> I, I've just heard that. We use expressions here without discussion on sound <laughs> So I heard. That's why I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> um, could you imagine a different voice type doing that piece? Yeah, I think so. I, I, I actually could imagine the voice of Rhino doing that bit. But, could you um, imagine Tom York doing that? A weird question. <laughs> <laughs> Sam's I mean, a weird there's guy. lots of singers like him who have the range, most likely. Like Hunter, yeah, kind of thing. Uh, is he is he a listener? Because if he'd like to do it, I'd be happy. <laughs> uh, that should be a project. We're gonna <laughs> shove this piece down Tom York's throat until he until he's on board. No, seriously. Okay. I mean, it's just um, the straight tone at the beginning made me think about it because to me that sounds like Dave even invoked this a lot more like it reminds you of pop music just the nature of that straight tone you know um, which is normally something you don't hear in art music what you take well, but it's, it, I, you know I, I love how like Michael Nyman uses the voice of Brano in the Cthulhu voice I remember I'm a Benjamin Britten fanatic so I do actually think of it in terms of, uh, of in mm. pop music or in um, classical music but yeah, yeah I, I Yes, Tom York should do this piece. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. We'll get his people on the phone and see if we can get that. Done. Sure. We'll so you, your you, people call his people. You yeah, said that. Uh, sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. So you said that um, you were writing this piece for kind of uh, a, a book tour, and it was going to be performed at kind of these book readings. Yeah. So did you consider the fact that it? might be a different audience than you usually would expect. Definitely. Uh, how, how did you adapt to that? Well, I mean, I, I don't know that I did other than I, I felt like it's, it's easy when you're writing a piece of, of music for the music crowd to, to, to fret about everything. Cause you know, very, you know, other composers are going to be there and uh, everybody's going to be judging you and blah, blah, blah. And I, I had, 
I was sort of a little freer to, to not worry so much because the, the book crowd is a different crowd. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, you know, the, tending to be more forgiving of, of music as I am probably of books. Um, <laughs> so it, I just, I felt a little freer. I felt like I wasn't going to be, I didn't have that like that occasional crippling of like, Oh my God, who's going to think what of this that you still never, ever, I think get over as a composer. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I, I had less of it. So I should say I wasn't like, it's gone. right. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, Interesting. It's not something that I think we often get to do as as, as composers is write a piece for the the people outside of our regular new music circle. It's an interesting exercise. Maybe. It's nice. It's it's really nice to do, and I think we should all. I mean, it's kind of like writing for dance in a way. Like you yeah. know, you're dealing with different a different set of rules and a different set of priorities, and and you, your place in it is different. And um, it's it's refreshing. Yeah, I think. Mm -hmm. And in this case, you also had a, this very direct collaboration with yeah. the the author, who is who is himself a spectacular musician. So okay, cool. And you what said, does he do as a musician? He's called John Wesley Harding. Um, and oh, he's so he's a, as a songwriter. Yeah, as a songwriter. Yeah, he's a okay. Singer, and a great song singer songwriter. Oh. And he runs these things in New York, these cabinets of wonders. Um, have been and I and I play the piano on them and I, and this piece was played on one of those cabinets and it's been great to like have a show where like Roseanne Cash and Rick Moody and a, and a juggler and Wes and my music were all on the same show. That's excellent, brilliant. Yeah, it's totally it's totally been a lot of fun. Another thing they did was was st studied juggling to join the circus. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can never do it. I can never juggle. Oh, so how, how did that collaboration work between you and Wes? I mean, he wrote the words and I wrote the music. So it was, it was, there was not a lot of back and forth? <laughs> I mean, uh, Wes is one of these incredible people that you'll be like, can you write me this? He'll be like, sure, here it is. Uh, <laughs> like, like an so, hour later? <laughs> he already did. What are you talking I about? Believe, I believe I changed one word, uh, which was he used, he used to say, the composer is a murderer. And I thought, how about every composer is a murderer? Mm -hmm. Which then became the title of the piece and sort of like, so I feel like I changed one powerful word, which he was totally fine with. But other than that, it was it wasn't like there was a huge drafting process. Okay. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. We should probably wrap up the show. Thank you so much for joining us this week. It oh, was, please, my pleasure. It was pleasure. really great to have you. Yeah. Any 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 banging of the drum you guys can do for uh, for for the fundraising of. Music after be great. Absolutely, oh. we'll have we'll have links to all those places that you mentioned in in our show notes on on the on the Sound Ocean site. Mm -hmm. Great, and and, and, really and those links, in addition to any comments that anyone watching might have to add to our conversation or questions about anything we talked about, can be found at soundnotion.tv/sn. That's the website for this show. Okay, um, and you can leave us a, a note there. Anybody can leave us a note there. And we're also on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, if you're listening or watching to this, watching this uh, at home, if you like the show, we'd love for you to share it with your friends. Please subscribe. We're available on iTunes and wherever finer podcasts are sold. Um, and you can also subscribe using links on our site. Again, soundnotion.tv slash sn. Sound Notion's introduction includes music by Patrick Gulo and video by Tyler Lepp. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next week.